Well, it's yeah, funny never. because I used to I used to do those bar A trains occasionally <laughs> in the summer, and it was funny because all the other conductors hated them because they were the bar A trains, yeah. and like they didn't want to deal with you guys, yeah. and I hated them because I wanted <laughs> to be partying with you guys. Like, yeah. I was like, Fuck this, dude. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the MCM Podcast. My name is Max. And my name is JR. And we are the intellectual masterminds behind the popular meme account on Instagram, Monmouth County Memes. And what we do with this podcast is invite, um, you know, whether they be influencers or business owners or comedians, public figures in New Jersey, and trying to um, help get their name out and show what they have to offer to the people of New Jersey. So I am definitely excited to announce today's guest. He is our first comedian that we are having on, as Jared just said. So he's extremely well known around New Jersey, especially the Jersey Shore, and has been featured on MTV, Spike, The Artie Lang Show, and Comedy Central. And uh, so I guess without further ado, welcome Ryan Marr to the first four, fourth ever MCM <laughs> podcast. You can find him on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Ryan Marr Comedy. And unfortunately, this isn't going to be on for two weeks, but tomorrow you have a show going on at Bar 8. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for having us, guys. Uh, it's it's well, us, me. I'm still half asleep. I was late for this. <laughs> yeah. I feel bad. You know, and it's funny because uh, you guys, you're very funny on Instagram. You make me laugh, but I, I love how like professional and serious you guys are with this like because you have all kinds of different business yeah. owners on and stuff right sure we, yeah you're not you're not used to us derelict comics like eventually you get musicians <laughs> in here i was supposed to be here an hour ago and uh i woke up at 11 30 and i was supposed to be here at 11 so uh i feel bad you shouldn't we we yeah, were honestly I, late too this morning we, we went to this like late. this we went to this like pliables like thing just the, they're like whatever this store and we were like oh my god let's run we're gonna be late so i'm not gonna lie when you dm'd us saying yeah. that I it was, was like a sigh of relief because we got here to my house at 1130. When so we, we told like, you to get here at 1130. Yeah. So we're everyone. I bet you the pliables people wouldn't have been late. Like they would have gotten up early. They would have had, you know, a protein shake. They would have been ready. <laughs> it's funny you say so because last time we shot a podcast, they came and delivered stuff to our house before we even started. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so they wouldn't have been late. You're no, right. No, definitely not. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I, I don't know if you could tell by looking at me, I'm not a pliables customer. I've had it. It's delicious. You but like it's, it? It's not a way of life for me, pliables. Not, Let's yeah. put it that way. It's, I, I was kind of like that. Too, I'm more though. of like a Jersey Mike's guy. Let me know when you have them on. <laughs> we have a friend it. who works at Jersey Mike's. We'll have him on. We'll get some uh, free sandwich. I want to have for them. You. I want to have Cluck You too. There's like this crazy dude that always posts on like the Cluck You Red Bank page. He's like pouring gasoline on himself. That's the type of guy <laughs> I want on. He's there used funny. to be one in Brick where I where I grew up. I don't know if it's still there, but I know there's one in Wall. That's uh, okay. Says, I mean, when I was a kid, Cluck You was big in Brick. I'm you like it? Than you guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, dude, it's fried chicken. Yeah, it's, wrong. It's, it's, hard, it's hard. It's really tough not to. We're allowed it. to curse on here. Good. Yeah, right. you're fine. All right. Don't yeah. worry about it. We're not, we're not making money off this right now. So <laughs> <Yeah>. earlier <laughs> on, we're fine. Yeah. We don't have to worry about YouTube taking everything away from us. Yeah, That's later. Not on. Yet. Not yet. Just Spotify. Yeah, we gotta watch out. <laughs> so I guess, you know, we, I mean, yeah. I mean, first I just want to say, how are you doing today? Other than waking up a little late? I'm good, man. I, uh, I'm excited to be here. I have a gig tonight. This actually worked out perfect. Uh, when you asked me to do this, um, I'm local tonight. I have a gig in brick at uh Quaker steak and lube, which is uh, an interesting place. It's, uh, I think it's a, you know, it's a chain. I think they're pretty big down South. There's a yeah. couple, I think there's one, you know, in Edison as well as the one in brick and, uh, an acquaintance of mine who I've done business with in the past at different places. He's like the regional manager and they wanted to try a comedy night in their little side room that has like, you know, 60 seats. Cool. And I said, you know, let's do it. And it's sold out. So I'm going to go there. And it's a little weird because over the last uh, two years of my career, I've been doing this since 2006 and full time since 2009, but I don't have a manager anymore. I kind of went off on my own and, uh, I'm booking a lot of my own shows and it's interesting because it's a completely different aspect of the business. Yeah. So, you know, it used to just be show up, get on stage, do the show, leave. Now it's like, oh shit, let me get there, you know, make sure the PA works, make sure. And, and honestly, I thought I wouldn't enjoy it, but I am enjoying it because yeah. I have more control. I get to uh, choose my openers now, which is really cool. Sure. Um, I'm producing shows at other venues and putting together shows that I want. I don't know if you guys are very familiar with comedy clubs, but what winds up happening a lot of times is that these bookers and owners, you just see these situations where it's like, 
why did they put those three acts together? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Sure. You know, and they're all amazing comics, but it just doesn't vibe well. Now I'm in a position where when I produce these shows, even if I'm not putting myself on it, it's like, okay, well, I know that if these three guys or girls go, like it's gonna, it's gonna kick ass. It's gonna be cool. So it's a fun little change for me. Um, and now I feel like I'm more hands-on, you know, because it used to just be, okay, write the jokes, go perform them. Now it's okay, I gotta deal with this guy. And you know, and sometimes it's stressful. But it, it pays off in the end. It's yeah. worth it. You're saving more money. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, wow, you you really, that, that was great. You went through like a lot of our stuff that we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, we I guess the podcast All right, guys, is good over. seeing you. So, yeah, thanks podcast, for coming. Thanks for driving 40 over. minutes around. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we, did, we do try and do our research on the people that come in. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, the stuff that, you know, everyone asks is, you know, how you started. We've already kind of, you know, we, we have so much deeper, awesomer, better stuff to talk about. That's but of course, for the fans that are just kind of maybe either seeing you for the first time or want to hear it again, um, I want you to talk about your story, you know, coming, you know, because you haven't always been a comedian. I no. know it started out as a part time thing. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, it's it's something that you love and you want to follow your dreams. So I just want to talk, talk to us about how, you know, it's been something where you came from something else, of course, and then you're into this now and, you know, how, how you like it. Yeah, I uh, well, so. I was involved in the pro wrestling business and I, I was like a lifelong fan of pro wrestling and I, and I got involved in it um, at like the age of 15. I had a buddy of mine. I'm, I'm older than you guys. I'm 36. So it, it's funny now because now I'm starting to finally get like a little bit of a younger fan base. Whereas sure. even when I started in my early 20s, I was doing comedy. The, the people that would come see me were in their 40s and, and above. Uh, so now it's kind of cool to get like a, a younger fan base. But back before, you know, memes and social media, there were message boards. That was the big thing in the yeah. late 90s. And uh, I had a friend who was just as much into pro wrestling as I was. And he just started like like messing with these like independent pro wrestlers on these message boards. And then we started going to shows because they thought he was funny. And so then like he kind of fell off with it, but I stayed involved. And even before that, as a kid, Iron Mike Sharp, who was like a, a wrestler in the WWF back in the day, he had a school in Brick, New Jersey, where he taught guys how to wrestle. And a lot of guys came from that school. Um, Stevie Richards, who went on to be in ECW and WWE and, and Chris Candido would stop by and work out there. Uh, all these guys. And I kind of just stayed in touch and I would set up the ring at these indie shows and then it led to me ring announcing, which led to me being the the heel manager for a lot of these guys. And one thing just kind of led to another. And, and comedy was always something that I wanted to try. But I'd be lying if I told you that my goal wasn't to be like a bad guy manager in the WWE. Exactly. Uh, um, which kind of <laughs> went away for a long time. Uh, now it's starting to make a comeback. But I mean, Paul Heyman, who's with Brock Lesnar, is doing such a phenomenal job that like no one's going to touch that ever. Yeah. So I, I kind of feel like he's the only guy. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I did that. And then I went to college for broadcast journalism. And college wasn't really my thing. Okay. Um, I got a job at B98.5 uh, radio and, you know, just then I dropped out of college like an idiot. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> oh, I got a job. But here's the thing. So like, you know, we were talking a little before terrestrial radio is dying. So that became a thing and and where it's like, okay, satellites started to take sure. over and the, the guys from terrestrial that had the experience were getting the satellite jobs. And then I just bounced around a little bit, you know, uh, Literally, I was a bouncer at Martell's Tiki Bar for Ooh, two years. Fun place. Love it there. And um, next thing you know, I'm working on the railroad as a train conductor for New Jersey Transit. Yeah. And I was miserable. Well, you were making good money, right? Um, yeah. Good money. But dude, I, when I tell you, like, just feeling, and, I, and I'm not trying to insult anybody because I still talk to some of the guys. But dude, it was just like, fuck, like, what am I doing with my life? Sure. You know, my grandfather worked on the railroad. My uncle did. My dad worked in New Jersey Transit bus. They all provided for their families, made great livings. But I'm 22 and I'm like, this sucks. Yeah. Like, I want to be creative. I want to be doing this fun shit. And I'm dealing with these guys that that literally come to work because they hate their wives. And then <laughs> they're, they're at work and then they hate the passengers. And it was just this whole circle of hatred and just misery. And I was like, I can't fucking do this, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um there was a comedy club. Oops, sorry about that. Oh, you're good. There was a comedy club. Uh, you're a busy guy. Of course, yeah. <laughs> it's another, and the other gig you got going today. <laughs> there was a comedy club that I'm not going to mention because we'll eventually get to that. I, I don't do business with them anymore. But they had like an open mic night, which I didn't know was a tournament. And I went up for the first time and I won round number one. And they're like, okay, come back next week. 
And then I won round number two, and I ended up winning the whole thing. Now, the problem was, was that that gave me a big head. That, <laughs> g- that g- made me very cocky because I'm like, I'm going up here now, and I'm competing, quote unquote, against these guys and girls that have two, three years of experience, but it was all open. But you, you've never done, like before that, never, like on stage? Never wow. before. I mean, the thing that I had as my background was being the bad guy manager on yes, the indies, sure. which, you know, a lot of times, like Honky Tonk Man, WWE Hall of Famer. Like we'd get back into the locker room and he goes, shit, man, you had me cracking up out there. I had to bite, you know, I had to bite my lip so I didn't laugh. <laughs> so I always was told that I was a funny guy, but I, I wasn't ignorant enough to believe that that would translate to being a good standup. Yeah. And so I got really cocky. Uh, and my prize for winning this tournament was getting to do a five minute set opening for Jackie, the joke man, Martling. Yeah. <laughs> and so I remember getting to the club that night and the owner telling me, all right, do five minutes and being cocky enough to be like, huh, only five. Because each week I was going up doing three to five and I thought, oh, I have a half hour of material. Yeah. Sure enough, though, there was a difference. When you're doing the open mics, it's a very supportive environment. Um, these guys and girls that were doing it were bringing their parents, their aunts, yeah. their uncles, their friends. Yeah. No one's going to shit on you and tell you you suck. Even if they're there to support somebody else, they're not going to be like, get off the stage, dick. You know, it's just not going to happen. It's like going to a little kid's Little League game and the parents cheer for both sides. That is a, that that is a perfect... Yeah. Ana- yeah, perfect a- analogy, except, you know, it's it's 22-year-old drunks that they're doing it for. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, I go up in front of Jackie Martling, and I'm thinking, oh, five minutes. But then I look into the audience, and it's, it's doctors, it's lawyers, yeah. it's, you know, people that paid $60 a ticket. And I went up there, and I stayed confident because I was used to speaking in front of large groups of people. And I forget what the first joke was, but it didn't hit. And then the second joke didn't hit. And then I was like, oh, fuck. And that became the longest five minutes of my life. Yeah. Like, I, I remember being about 45 seconds in, being like, get me the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yeah. But at that point, I was like, you know what? I've already, I'm already invested in this. Let me get serious with it, you know? And that's when I realized, holy shit, I don't have a half hour material. I don't even have five minutes. I had stuff that worked at open mics. I mean, when I tell you the shit that I was doing was so fucking brutal, like just not even funny. Like I I was a train conductor still at the time. So I remember one of the jobs I did was in Trenton and the Trenton train station is in a not very nice area. (laughs) And so you're going over this little bridge and there was a sign that said no horses, and it's like in the middle of the ghetto. And I remember like that was a bit that I would do, which was <laughs> so fucking stupid. Like, you know, like almost like Seinfeld-esque without the brilliance. Like, sure. you know, uh, oh, a horse in the hood. Yeah. Like, you know, stupid <laughs> shit like that. And just, and that's what you do when you start out. You just try for these observations that that really mean nothing. They're not true to your life. They're not true to uh, what you go through. You're just like, oh my God, I need material. Where can yeah. I grab from? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like that's it's it's crazy. I mean, the fact that like it's at first like you just coming up and doing that, and you know it's so scary. But like you said, when you're on that stage, there's no turning back. Like no. you're, like you just you have to go with it. And I mean, listen, even the fact that you're up there in the first place, in my opinion, is something not a lot of people would even do in the first place. They'd be they'd be scared to even be up there. Well, you know what's funny to me too? Like I, I did. I mean, all right, now the open mics, yeah, they 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 were. It was kind of like a, a, a dare to myself. But what amazes me now is when I see people that want to do it and they'll go up in an environment like, the, the, like, all right, I did a show in Connecticut once. I'll never forget. It was an audition and I was already working for about two years as a comic. But so what they did was it was like six open mic level guys and then they would audition one or two guys. But the host was a professional who worked the club. And I'll never forget right before my audition spot, this kid who had never done comedy before goes up and he's shit faced and he goes up and he's like, my sister has this stuffed animal. It's called the purple monster. <laughs> Where's this going? And I fuck it. Like, he's just, he's like, so I'm like, oh my God, I have to, and like, people are like, what the fuck? And people are leaving. So the host I would love uh, that. just goes, of course, thank you guys. I, <laughs> You would love it, but the audience did not. I mean, it was Connecticut, you know? So it was like, huh, what is this? So the host went up afterwards, and even though it was my audition, he made it look like I was a special guest. Yeah. Which, it happens a lot in comedy, we'll bail you out. Like, he lied. He was like, you've seen this guy on Comedy Central, and you've seen him here. And that got them to go, okay, he's not the purple monster guy fucking the stuffed animal. And then I went up and I was able to have a good set. So sure. a lot of that happens too. There's a, it, It's basically illusions being yeah. created. You know, it, it's the audience 
sees or hears certain things, they're going to go, okay, we'll take this guy serious. Yeah. yeah. You, know? you, you mentioned that, that first, you know, actual five minute set you did, didn't go perfectly well. I mean, like how long no, do you it think it, it was terrible? Was it a total yeah. bomb? Oh, without yeah. a doubt. So how long did you think it took you to like find, you said you were doing, you know, like observational stuff. How long did it take for you to like find your voice and what you wanted to say and the type of material you wanted to put out? Well, so here, here's part of the, the thing too. And, and now, I mean, look, I believe in constant evolution and, and, and changing. And it's funny because even though I'm not a huge fan of today's current pro wrestling product, mm -hmm. uh, for those that are wrestling fans, there's a guy, Chris Jericho, who's God, almost 50. And I've been a fan of his since I was like 15 or 16 years old. And he's constantly evolved. His character has gone through all these different incarnations over, God, seven or eight different times, you know? And comedy, I, I believe if, it, if, it's, if it's the best form of comedy, it's truth. And I think as a person, you evolve, right? So I feel like what I was doing then was I was being more gritty and I was talking about shit that bothered me, stuff that I saw. And it was about the political correctness in society and things like that. And I still have elements of that in my act. But now I'm also doing a lot more self-deprecation because you learn certain things. There was a guy, Jay Black, who I used to open for, who I'd go on stage at the time. I remember I had like an Orange County Choppers like work shirt and jeans and <laughs> Doc Martin boots. And I was in a little bit better shape than I am now. But I still had the shaved head and, you know, the goatee. And I would go up... And if I dropped one f bomb, like I remember, I would notice audience members be like, "Oh," but then Jay Black, who would go up like in a cardigan sweater, and you know he would go up and he would talk about pussy farts, <laughs> <laughs> and those same people that would cringe at me saying "fuck" would be like, "Oh," because it was like their grandson yeah, saying something exactly. dirty. Yeah, you know. So you learn how. You know, even things that you can't control, an audience would respond to. Yeah. I can't help how I look. I'm a big guy. I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe some would find that intimidating. So now what I do is I do a lot more self-deprecation. I do yeah. a lot more like what I would talk with my buddies about. I talk yeah. about gaining weight. I talk about, you know, being single and and approaching this world yeah. now with dating. And yeah, I saw, I saw your dating yeah. set the other yeah. And so... I feel like that kind of disarms an audience, puts them at ease, makes them feel uncomfortable. So that now when I do go into my politically incorrect stuff and I'm making fun of, you know, different people or whatever, they're going to go, oh, he's not a bad guy. Yeah. You know, he just talked about his man tits for yeah. 10 minutes. Well, they, <laughs> yeah. they, could, they could relate to you. And the thing is what like with that, with what you're saying is, you know, they're developing a connection with you yeah. where they like you first. And then when you do come up with the more controversial stuff, uh, you know, he's a good guy. He's just an average guy, he, you know. It, but if they didn't like you at first and then you say, you know, the more fucked up shit showing up with pitchforks at your house and yeah. shit like that. Um, well, it's funny, too. You have to connect with the audience. And, yeah. and when I was just out in L.A. again in December, I did a spot with that with a friend of mine. Um, uh, she, you know, she lives in Ventura, California. A girl I went to elementary and high school with. And she was like, hey, I friend of mine's running a comedy show at the Ventura Harbor Comedy Club. Would you like to do a spot? So I went up and I did it. And I noticed that what a lot of them were doing and you see this in New York City, too these showcase rooms because they're they're wanting to do a Letterman spot. They're wanting to to get on, not Letterman, but I just dated myself, Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> uh, they they want a, one of those late night spots. So they're doing their six to seven minute set and they're just okay. going up and going right into jokes. And I was watching like, and they're professionals out there, but it was like six or seven comics go up and they were just eating it because this yeah. audience, they, they want to be engaged. Yeah. So I had like an eight minute spot and I went up there and I, you know, greeted them. How's everybody doing? Anybody celebrate anything, which is tough to do in a showcase format. But I did like a minute on that, went to the self-deprecation. And then the host, who was a, a, a professional, was like, oh, my God, you got applause breaks. And you did. Yeah. I said, yeah, because I engaged them. Yeah. I said, you know, I know that the booker for Jimmy Kimmel isn't in the fucking crowd tonight. Like, he's not going to go, <laughs> sure. oh, Ryan, on a Thursday night at Ventura Harbor, come on down, you know? <laughs> so it's about engaging the audience and I feel like a lot of that gets lost. Yeah. You know, because everyone's focused on, oh my God. Just good know. material. Or yeah, and you need to have the good material, but everyone's just worried about putting up that video clip yeah. or, yeah. you know, going viral or and it's just, come on, man. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, looking, you, you like you're saying about being being on other shows and things like that, MTV Spike. Personally, back in the day, I, I don't know if I was the only one, but no one else really watched it. I used to watch the Artie Lang show and I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I watched your whole segment on there. I thought it was it was really funny. Thanks, man. Um, I saw, you know, John obviously was there too. Did you ever get to meet, like, there was a guy, what is his name, Mike Buschetti, who yeah. would always yeah. have on just one of the funniest. Yeah, Mike's a good dude. 
He, and yeah, he's a, he does stand up too, right? Yeah. Think, okay. And, and he's actually a very funny stand up. A lot of one liners. Yeah. Uh, a lot of self deprecation. Artie and him, I haven't spoken to Artie in a, in a while. I'd love to uh, reconnect with him. He just had the show, I think, in uh, in Red Bank, like he at did. the Count Basie, not too weird yeah, thing about Count. Um, I actually, I, I haven't spoken to him. I dealt with his manager. Uh, recently, because I wanted to get Artie for a show, but because of the way the contracts were working out, because of his stuff with the Basie, it didn't really pan out. But uh, yeah, I, I believe now they have a podcast. It's called Artie Lang's Halfway House, and he has Bichetti back. Good. With him. I'll, I'll watch yeah. that. Yeah, okay. and I think a lot of it's on YouTube, and Artie sure. posts. I think Artie on Instagram is Artie Lang 67. Sure. Um, And he posts a lot of that stuff, dude. And he's doing good, man. Oh. So God bless him. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy just to see him being healthy yeah. and able to do yeah. a lot of stuff because. You know, he's at, at you know at his best. He's such a funny dude. I mean, just just being able to. Well, I think that's part of. And, and look, I'm not. I don't want to let on like I was like good friends with him. He was very nice to me, and, yeah. I, and I enjoyed his company. And every time we were around together, but I think that was what part of his uh, demons were was the fact that first of all, the guy's a genius. I think I'm very good at what I do. I have to work very hard. Not saying that Artie doesn't, but Artie's just a a genius. He's one of those guys that you just laugh when you're around him because he's got that element of being like your uncle from Jersey who's crazy. Yeah. yeah. But he also comes up and, and and a lot of people don't realize this. He he is such a deep thinker and some really brilliant stuff just comes from him as well. So I think that that's a battle. And I think that what happens is is that that whole stern fan base and I've seen it too you know, you have your buddies they are like, ah, shit, Ryan. Yeah. You know, I used to get fucked up with him, whatever. <laughs> and they're great guys and yeah. they mean well. But, you know, when I do something that's really well thought out and written and that I practice, they're like, yeah, what are you fucking too smart for us now? And sure. I think that that's like that constant internal battle that Artie's had to deal with is that like, yeah, he's the lovable you know, guy who drinks his Jack Daniels and gambles. But also he comes out with some brilliant stuff. And I think that's a balance that people have to, you know, keep in this business. And uh, it's tough to balance sometimes. Yeah, I, <laughs> when when you look at the state of comedy right now, you were talking about how like brilliant Artie Lang is. Who do you see as being the best at what they're doing? Oh, it's so tough, man. Because yeah. it's it's um, it's like music. It's subjective. Mm. And and what's funny about it, it's it's so much like music, but so different in the sense that if you don't. I'm not a musician and I wish I was. I have no musical inclination whatsoever. I can't sing. Uh, I took drum lessons as a kid. I was terrible. I feel like you can hone. I feel like you have to have a natural talent yeah. and then you can hone it or you're a genius where you just do it, which is very rare. I have a friend. It's so funny. He's a doctor. He's an MD. And I'm not going to say his name because it was a private conversation, but he's hilarious. He was in the Air Force. He became a doctor. And uh, I said to him, I said, well, what made you like decide you want to become a doctor? He goes, I was 16 and I was a redhead. I was like, I got to do something, dude, you know? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, he goes, I had to bust my ass. He goes, because, you know, I'm not a genius. I had to work hard. So I think that, you know, with comedy, there's some guys that just are just a brilliant and, and they get up there and they do it. And there's other guys that work really hard at it. And it is subjective. If you hear a, if you hear a song, you might go, ah, it's not my thing, but you're not going to go, ah, what the fuck? That song sucks. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going to do that. With comedy, that happens. Yeah. With comedy, if you personally don't find somebody funny, you tend to go, ah, oh, that guy fucking sucks. Why yeah. does he have a job? Um, so I don't know, man. For right now, there's so many guys that are working that aren't known, yeah. you yeah. know, and that that are really good. As far as guys that are known, like, I mean, I love Bill Burr. Yeah. Um, but again, a lot of those guys too, like the, it's an interesting dichotomy because they say the best comedy comes from truth, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bill Burr is such an angry guy. Well, you just sold out Madison Square Garden, oh, yeah, you know, got, five yeah. nights. What are you so fucking angry yeah. about, dude? Like, yeah, you know? Right, I know. So, I mean, th there's that always that balance too. I try, especially over the last couple of years, to just kind of focus on what I'm doing. But th there's so many guys out there that are just, you know, that are killers, man. Yeah. You know, that's the problem too is that there's, there's so many great comics and not enough venues. So Ryan, one thing, you know, we, we, I think we know social media pretty well. I mean, the thing I hate about it is that you kind of have to be so PC to an extent that, you know, people might try and, you know, cancel you if they don't like what you're seeing. I see, um, I don't know if I follow, uh, we'll have to friend you on Facebook, but I see that you post on your Instagram, a lot of your posts. Yeah. Screenshots. And, yeah. And they're, they're hilarious because you don't hold back. And, that, <laughs> and that's, and that for, for a guy like me, I love that. Like, I've I actually calmed that. down. I've calmed down. 
believe yeah. it or not. I, um, you know what, dude? And, and it's weird. And again, maybe I've, I've hindered my own, uh, career. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't take this job to have to be told what to do. And, and listen, you know, some of the best advice I've gotten and some of the worst advice I've gotten is from some of these, you know, full-time comics that are in their fifties and sixties. They've given me fantastic pointers on, you know, uh, what to do as far as, you know, honing the writing and stage presence or, Hey, you know what? Your cadence, when you delivered that joke, maybe if you tried it this way and thank you. And I still cherish that, you know, cause you're always learning. But one of the worst things was taking advice on the business aspect of it. And I feel now that what's happening, you know, I'm 36 years old. You guys are in your early twenties. I'm feeling like there's starting to be a resurgence. And I see it a little bit with you guys, you guys though, you have a different thing going. Cause you, I mean, you're dealing with different like businesses and stuff like that. And you guys got a very professional thing going, but I'm noticing amongst your age group. Now there's a little bit of a, uh, a pushback. You know, I don't do colleges anymore. I'm actually debating maybe getting back into them. The last college I did was Thomas college in Waterville, Maine, where they handed me a list, a literal list of things that I couldn't talk about. Oh my God. Yeah. And I'm reading down the list and the best part I go, you know, so you have the, the, the student advisor and then you have like their faculty advisor and they book the show together. And one of the things says no size jokes. So I jokingly say backstage, I go, well, I don't talk about my dick. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get like all like, Oh, oh God. And, uh, and this is probably about six, seven years ago now. And, uh, I go, what does that mean? No size jokes. They go, well, you know, we don't want you to talk about, you know, someone being too thin or overweight. And I said, well, I'm overweight. I said, and I do a lot about that. I said, you know, it's actually kind of right up front. Um, and then she goes, oh, well, you're not that overweight. And I'm like, look, I don't need you to placate to me. I'm telling yeah. you what my act is. And she goes, well, we don't want you to do that. And I said, but it's about me. And she goes, well, there might be somebody in the audience that's having some issues with their size and accepting it. And you, and I, so finally I just got so fucking annoyed and it was a high paying gig. I was getting like a thousand dollars for the hour. I went out there and I was like, uh, Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm like, uh, tonight I'm not allowed to talk about drugs <laughs> or sex or whatever. And then I, you know, I, I kind of got my way through it, but I also noticed something too. And again, you don't want to shame or whatever, but the people that are going to a comedy show on a Friday night at a college in the student union are, you know, wearing their Harry Potter hoodies and stuff like that. They're not the people that I want to associate with yeah. when I was in college. Yeah. You know, they weren't the people that were going to parties, trying to meet people. I, I feel like a lot of times there are people looking to be offended, looking to be angered. And I got to a point where I don't want to sound like a tough guy because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. That's not the goal of this. But it's like, stay the fuck home, dude. And as far as Facebook and Instagram, I don't even really do Twitter that much anymore. But like, I, if you don't like it, don't follow me. Exactly. I am so tired. I used to try to explain myself because I, and I still do care. I do not want to hurt anyone's feelings. I think I've gotten this uh, reputation over the years as, as being edgy and wanting to shock people. I don't, I want to make you laugh. But if my sense of humor is not your cup of tea, then go the other way. You know, I'm just, I'm tired of, of trying to have to explain. I really don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I don't want to make anyone feel bad about themselves. It's not my intent, but I can't worry about that. Yeah, no. I have a great story that I'll tell you real quick. There's a comic named Mitch Fattel who's amazing. Uh, he had a Comedy Central special back in the mid 2000s. It was called Mitch Fattel's Magical. Does a lot of very um, sexual material, but it's funny. He goes up there and he talks like this. He gets like real creepy. <laughs> so he does this joke and uh, it's a great joke where he says, uh, I went on a date last week with a girl and I knew I was going to get laid because she left her drink at the table. <laughs> now this was, this was pre me too. You got to remember this was like, you know, whatever. And, and the fucking He's audience, fucked. the audience comes unglued, right? <laughs> I go up and at the time, my closing bit and my CD that I put out in 2011 was called Off the Rails and it was illustrated. It was a train with a guy laying on the tracks and me standing on top of the train in my conductor uniform holding a microphone because when there were train suicides, which was very prevalent at the Jersey Shore, it is. but this was before all of that. I wrote the joke in 2006. That started happening around 2010 and- I do the joke about train suicide and how we would get three paid days off. And I was like, it's almost like an incentive. You know, I would go for the three day weekend every week and stuff. And it's a whole bit that I would do. 
Woman comes up to me after the show. Mitch is standing next to me. He's selling his CD. I'm selling mine. She buys his CD, tells him he's fantastic, comes up to me and says, you, you're a scumbag. Yeah. And I said, excuse me? Yeah. Turns out she decides to tell me that her nephew was one of the people that jumped in front of a train. And I'm saying, you know what? Like, I, I didn't know that. We don't get a list of what to talk about or what not to talk about yeah. when I walk in. You know what I mean? So what are we doing? Lighting candles in the... I completely... <laughs> like, I was looking at I was going to say, what are you trying to do here? You're trying to interrupt his uh, great <laughs> no. story. No, what it's great. Yeah, you, you can't hear that song, but yes, I was you looking at yeah, you. Can. You can totally uh, hear it. It's totally very loud. Can. No, But uh, my point is, is that you can't placate to everybody. No. You know, every joke has, and I hate to use the term victim, but every joke has a victim, a target, right? Yeah. So... You know, uh, you can't laugh at everything else that's edgy, that's going to offend somebody and then go, mm -hmm. oh, but no, that hits too close to home for me. Yeah. You know, so I said to the woman, I said, OK, well, I'm sorry, but he was doing date rape jokes, yeah. you know, yeah. and that's OK. Yeah. And I'm, I wasn't trying to throw him under the bus, no. but I, I was just trying to say, like, why is trained suicide off limits? But a, a date rape joke's OK. And I swear to God, she looked me in the eye and she goes, well, I was never raped. Oh, so that makes it OK. So now if somebody else in the audience was raped, do they have the right to hate him yeah. but love my joke about sure. train suicide? Like, just fucking stop it. Go to the comedy club, yeah. forget your problems, and just laugh or don't. We don't want you to fake laughing, but you don't have a right to say he shouldn't talk about that. You yeah. just don't have that right. No. Why would she go in the first place? Like, then if you don't want to, like, laugh and – because, you know, if you put yourself in that situation, you know, you might be around people that will say something that you might not agree with. That doesn't mean he's a shitty person or this and that. Just you might not laugh, but why Why hate him? I think what happens too is I was probably about 12 years old when the Nutty Professor movie with Eddie Murphy came out. I almost said the original Nutty Professor, but it wasn't. The original was with Jerry Lewis. But uh, I remember there's that scene in, uh, in the movie where Dave Chappelle, yeah. you know, is the comic on stage and he rips apart you know, Sherman Klump or whatever. And then, of course, Eddie Murphy comes back with Buddy Love and destroys him. But I have a feeling that for some reason, you know, I'm amazed at how many people have never been to a comedy club and never been to a comedy show that enjoy comedy, which which cracks me up. Like, you know, I'll have people that'll come up to me and go, oh, my God, Sebastian Maniscalco. And I'm like, yeah, I've opened for him. And they're like, really? I'm like, well, yeah. You know, I mean, the guy did clubs yes. before he blew up. Um, I think what happens is people people see that scene where Dave Chappelle's character is attacking Sherman Klump for being fat and going, oh, come on, you're so fat. That's not what happens. I yeah. mean, yeah, there's jokes directed at audience members like, oh, hey, buddy, like, you know, do you really have to wear that shirt? You know, stuff like that. I'm looking at you. No, okay, but like, stuff, <laughs> stuff along those lines. Yeah, I'll change. Wear that yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, no one's, we're, we're not up there to make you feel like shit about yourself. Yeah. And I think that that's the misconception. A lot of people go, and I can't sit up front. Because well, the comedian will see us. Well, yeah, there's 130 seats. I'm going to fucking see all of you. you yeah, know? well, and the other thing is you're not trying to make someone feel shitty about themselves, but it's it's good to laugh at yourself sometimes. Oh, when a comedian gosh. points out something that's like, you know, funny about you, if yeah. you can't laugh about it, that's your own problem. Ryan, really. please it's rip not... us apart tomorrow night. <laughs> I will, like, we will yeah, never. Seriously. We'll, we'll be in the front and you can I talk shit die. about like, us Like, there's nothing, want. like, I. that's what I love. Like, we tear each other apart all the time as friends. Yeah. Like, you know what, you with your boys. Like, it just, like, there's nothing like, oh, dude, you never get laid. <laughs> well, that's that's why I love the bar. RA shows because what's, what's interesting about those I, I performed there God so many times over the years and it's been about three years since I've done a show there but Bar A is different. I'm, Tommy Janarone, who's one of the owners, uh, he's an entertainment attorney. I met him through a comedian named Jim Florentine years ago. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Crank Anchors on Comedy Central. Okay. Jim Florentine was the voice of Special Ed. Okay. I got mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I opened for Jim uh, at a local club back in 2007. Um, and then he brought me to Bar A afterwards and I met Tommy and Tommy's literally one of my you know five best friends we've had so many great times over the years and he's one of the owners of bar a but what i love about there is that people show up to bar a as a lot of people who i know a lot of friends a lot of acquaintances a lot of people who have followed my career over the years and it's awful i mean anything goes dude i mean tomorrow at bar a and i know when this podcast comes out it's going to already be passed but it's the biggest equivalent to feeling like a rock star you know and i've done the borgata you know, a thousand seats, the music box, but there's something about bar a where, again, I always, I said earlier, I want to be a musician and I have no musical inclination. <laughs> I feel like a rock star yeah. because it's just, it's a party. You know, there's yeah. going to be girls coming up on stage, handing me shots that Tommy sent them like, Hey, go get them fucking drunk. <laughs> there's going to be, there's going to be that. Um, 
and and it's it's awesome you know now they're not all like that obviously you know i'll do corporate gigs where i have to wear a suit and and they're fun too i enjoy every aspect of the job but the bar a shows man they're just they're something special even the jank shows that i do in the summer those are great i can't wait for those but yeah. uh you know even that it's a tuesday night it's a little you know the audience is a big age range there's people in there fit. tomorrow is just gonna be fucking animals at bar yeah. a. it's gonna be a good time <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it i really am one of the things you brought up dave Chappelle. I want to talk about, um, in a way, the state of comedy right now, because there are some people who get away with being offensive, like the way you were talking yeah. about. Like, Dave Chappelle doesn't. Like, I mean, he does in the fact that he's successful, but he gets nailed by everybody for it. And then, like, you were, I mean, Artie Lang, but I'm thinking, like, when I listen to Howard Stern still, I mean, I'm. it's almost surprising that, like, he, I feel like he doesn't get the criticism for, like, the whole, the, the whack pack and stuff like that. Like, well, he, he does, he's changed a lot. I'm a big Howard He has changed, yeah, yeah. But I still think that sometimes when I listen, I'm like, I'm shocked that he can still, and they play the older episodes, yeah. too. I'm like, I'm surprised that people don't get mad about this, because, like, Dave Chappelle gets, you know, hammered for making jokes about, you know, you know, gay people, LGBT, all that stuff. He, he just gets absolutely destroyed, and Howard Stern sometimes makes fun of people with mental disabilities yeah. and kind of gets away with it. So what do you think is really... You know, is it because it's radio? People well, just- well, no. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't answer. I think because Howard has gone um, very left wing in a lot of ways, yeah. which, you know, it's amazing. People go, oh, he's evolved. He's changed. But he still did something called Fist Fest a few months ago, <laughs> which I'm not even going to talk about. If you guys want to Google that, they're listening. Google <laughs> sounds, it. Sounds pretty fun. But yeah. uh, <laughs> all, all the tell the 12 year olds watching. Definitely. <laughs> don't, don't yeah, don't. That. Don't. But but here's here's the interesting thing, though, too. And I've always had this argument and I've gotten to see it firsthand because I did a lot of work with Beetlejuice early yeah. on. Be- and be- I never, I'll never forget doing the Lane Theater in Staten Island, New York. It was myself, uh, the Reverend Bob Levy, and Beetlejuice. Yeah. And Beetlejuice was pretty much billed as the headliner. Yeah. And I went up and I did a half hour. Yeah. Bob Levy went up, did an hour. Crushed. Yeah. Wow. Beetlejuice went up to do five minutes. <laughs> and it was basically Levy holding the mic and just asking beat questions and beat answering them. Yeah. And then afterwards, you know, I had my CD, Levy had his CD and t-shirts, but who sold, you know, a thousand dollars in pictures, Beetlejuice. Yeah. And I always said to those people, you know, if it weren't for Howard Stern, yeah, what would Beetlejuice be doing? In all honesty, he'd be, you know, he, he his mental capacity is, is to the point where he couldn't even hold a menial job. Yeah. But meanwhile, you know, he's made enough money to pay the rent for his mother yep. and everything like that. So when I say it's kind of like that old argument, not to get political, where people that are very, um, you know, uh, pro life. Yeah. Oh, you know, abortion. Yeah. Well, what happens when that kid's born? What are you, you going to give a fuck? Mm-hmm. You know, so it's very easy for people to go, oh, Howard exploits these people. No, they're yeah. getting between $3,000 yeah. to $5,000 in appearance. Yeah. You know, uh, G- Gary the Conqueror, as they call <laughs> him now, he used to be Gary the Retard. Yeah. People have had him at their weddings. Yeah. You know, just know. like as a goof. And oh, how horrible he's being exploited. Yeah, he got $3,000 for that. No, I've t- I, you I know? completely agree so, with you. So uh, that again, it, it comes down to you you can't worry about what people think. You just got to go, okay. And look, yeah. I'm just as guilty. I'm only finally now at 36 getting to a point where I'm like, "All right, man." Cuz no matter what you do, no matter what you say in this social media culture, someone's going to be offended by it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I you know, completely agree. It doesn't even have to just be comedy. We just saw Gail King interviewing Lisa Leslie, all right, about Kobe Bryant. Yeah. And and they're talking about, you know, the uh, allegations that Kobe, you know, went through in 2003. Lisa Leslie, who was Kobe's best friend, was like a sister to him, says, he never showed those signs to me. I don't believe it. Dot, dot, dot. I'm not saying it didn't happen. Because what she's saying is, is that I know it didn't happen yeah. in her mind, but I can't say you that can't that say woman's that. lying. Of course not. Yeah. So, you no matter what you do, no matter what you say, everyone has a voice, and a lot of people feel that they can just espouse that opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And you're gonna piss people off. Yeah. So you can either have anxiety about it and say nothing, or you can go fuck it. I'm gonna live my life. Well, honestly, dude, I think I saw like Gail got a lot of backlash. She got. Oh, Snoop Dogg was like well, absolutely Snoop Dogg, annihilated well, her. Well, Snoop, well, Snoop, 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 well, Snoop Dogg was like, like things he I'm said. He's like, I'm gonna kill I'm you. Com- we're, we're coming for you. Yeah. I was I mean, like, wasn't, it's not smart. It's no. just a stupid he's thing a, to say. He's, he's it's not, if you get mad at somebody, you know, if you if you want to respond to that, fine. Yeah. But when you respond with something like you know, 
talking about violence yeah. or like you know it's, it's just it's not smart i've it's had people i've had people literally th- that i don't know yeah. threaten me with yeah if you ever get a break we have screenshots of jokes you've read okay bro i got shane gillis doing the first show at janks july 7th here's wow. a guy yeah. who yeah. you know uh he, he got hired by saturday night live yep. and then fired three days later because of an out of context quote from a podcast you know three four years ago sure and you know, it made national news, you know, and, and it's funny because when I see that being talked about in a Democratic presidential debate, I go, really? I go, that's what we need to focus on? You know, you're running for president of the United States and we have to talk about a comedian yeah. who made an Asian joke when everybody in the United States of America has ordered Chinese food at some point in their life. And then as soon as the waiter turned around and went, oh, OK, all right, yeah, <laughs> you know, like don't fucking act all high and mighty sure. and self-righteous. We we embrace differences. I talk about it on stage. There's positive stereotypes, okay? And then there's funny stereotypes that we goof on. There's still stereotypes. Yeah. My weight issues started because I was dating an Italian girl for three years. She was a phenomenal cook. Everything she made was awesome. And I'd compliment her. I'd be like, baby, that was great. And her response every time, I'm Italian. That's what we do. What yeah. do you expect? Positive stereotype. Italian women can cook. Yeah. But then once, you know, I point out that her goatee is getting a little thick. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, I'm the asshole. <laughs> so, so what I'm, I'm saying is, is that just laugh, you know, yeah. just laugh or don't. But yeah. you don't, you don't have a right to say, oh, you shouldn't talk about that, because yeah. we all embrace stereotypes. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, well, I mean, and, and that's the thing that's scary is you look at other countries and stand-up comedians are getting fined for saying things that are that they that they yeah. find that yeah. the government finds to be, you know, and that's the one thing that I think separates us from other countries is yeah. that we have the ability to say what we want as long as we're not calling to violence or, you know, saying there's a bomb in a crowded theater. Like that's, you're not allowed to, that's illegal. But I mean, well, what, pe- what, people, people, you know, have misconceptions about what the first amendment really is. I mean, yeah. the first amendment basically just allows you, and I'm not a lawyer, but you know, from my understanding of it, it just means that the government can't punish you for things that you say yeah. within reason, yes. like, you know, meaning the, the fire and thing, but you ha- can't have your career destroyed. And well, your image is screwed up. Like legally, like they won't put you in jail. But by the time you know everyone calls it a witch hunt yeah. at, over one thing that you said, they already fucked you. Yeah. So by that point, it's like you know. So- but that's why I feel like, and, and you know, again, I hate to say your guys' generation because I don't even know if technically we're different generations. I mean, I'm 15 years older than you, but yeah, we are. The thing is, is that it, I, I have a feeling there's going to be a pushback, and and I because kids naturally rebel, right? So I, I think what's happening now is that as my generation and a little bit younger is bringing more kids into the world, and they're being raised in this environment where everything is considered bullying. You know, when I was a kid, bullying was you know we're gonna harass this person daily to the point of where they're in tears. Now bullying is considered some good natured jokes, yeah. uh, horseplay, things of that nature. I have a feeling that the kids that are growing up in that environment are going to push back. They're going to rebel. You know, I'm hoping they do. Hopefully everything that we see now, I mean, my generation too, like, you know, they want to talk about me too. You know, we grew up on MTV spring break, Jerry Springer, girls in bikinis doing crazy shit. And and now they're like, Oh no, you got to do this. Well, now I'm saying to myself, you know what? Look at these kids now that have access to everything on their phones. You know, when I was 12, my idea of pornography was when the scrambled Playboy channel came in and you're like, oh, I think I see a tit. I think that's a tit. That's definitely, oh no, that's the guy, but it's still a tit. Yeah. You know, <laughs> now 13 year olds have, you know, bukkake gangbangs on their iPhone. Yeah. And so how, how, that, yeah. how are you going to say that like when those people are in their late twenties and thirties and going out, what that there's not going to be an epidemic of sexual harassment. These, these fucking kids grew up with that, you know? Yeah. So Definitely. It's, it's tough, man. I guess it was back then it was a lot harder to find, you know, these weird fetishes, but like you could Jesus. Well, oh. I mean like the, the I mean enough about your personal life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't check well, don't look at my Yeah, phone yeah, yeah. So, so so we are a different generation, but I still think that I think that Max and I are like in that last generation where we didn't grow up with smartphones. We grew up with like a Game Boy or like of those. Did Nokia you guys phones. really? Yeah, I didn't have I didn't I didn't have an like an we didn't actual have an iPhone smartphone until, until like, like high, school. high school. Okay. Um, so, and yeah. And and like I definitely think that like for example I have a younger brother who's 12. Yeah. You know and he's always had access to that stuff yeah. like that. I'm like I mean like so well, maybe you, we're not as different as we thought though. I don't think we're as different because I definitely think that we had that childhood where we were outside all the time. We were doing stuff with friends every day and I know that my younger brother and his friends are not like that at all and like 
I, I would push him like, you know, you got to like do something. You can't yeah. just sit in your house and stare at the iPad or play like video games all day. Like, I mean, it's fun. I get it. You got to go out and do stuff. You got to experience the real world because you spend so much time living through a screen. It makes real world interactions really difficult. Yeah, you're right. Um, and and it, I mean, I, it, so I went to Mons, well, now it's Donovan Catholic, but I went to Monsignor Donovan Mon in, in Tom's River. And I'll never forget, you know, my senior year. I think it was my senior year, which was 2001. That was like the first year that like my Motorola fucking banana flip phone yeah. like took like a grainy, shitty picture. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, this is so fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then I went back a few years later because I'm still very close with my one English teacher who, you know, loved me and I loved her. She would have me come back for career day and speak to the students. And I'll never forget. I was still in my 20s. And uh, some girl's like, are you on Twitter? And I'm like, yeah, you know, Ryan Moore comedy. And she's like, okay, thank you. And my phone was in my pocket. And all of a sudden it was just like, brr, brr, yeah. brr. and I'm like, holy shit, all these kids are following me yeah. oh, no. while they're sitting in the classroom. Like, yeah. And I'm like, that's a completely different world. Like we had to carry books, you know, they all have laptops. So I know. it's it's weird to watch things change. But then at the same token, I say to myself, like I also used to be able to go in my Catholic school uniform to the Exxon in my uniform and buy cigarettes <laughs> and be like, you know, they were three dollars a pack at the time. So I would say to them, "Hey, give me five bucks," and I'd have like a little side hustle going. Yeah, sure. You know, yeah. there was a bar called uh, Phil's Liquor Locker in Silverton. They served me beer in my Catholic school uniform. Like clearly knowing you're on, knowing you're yeah. On the so yeah. my so you know because it was like some World War II vet who was behind yeah, the bar. Yeah. Hey, kid, how are you? Yeah. You know. So I say to myself, like, okay, that's not good. But at the same token, like, there was a whole culture and becoming more cultured that I feel like this generation isn't going to get. Yeah. Um, is that good or bad? I don't know. I you think know? there's just too, there's too many rules nowadays. Like yeah. it's just like, it feels you, like you're not free to do. You're not like, you're not like, of course, like in what we were talking about is like, I personally, like I would not like to grow up with this in my hands because I post stupid shit now as a 23 year old that I think I know what I'm doing. But no. like, if I had this in my hand as a freaking like, you know, eight or nine year old, Oh my God. Like, I, like I, I just wouldn't like, if there's, you know, if there's ever a fight going on or something, like you could literally have that live yeah. and yeah. just ruin someone. So it's yeah. just like, one of the things I do is uh Facebook memories every day. I just yeah. scroll through it. And sometimes it takes me about a half hour because it, you know, it's everything that you've ever put on that day. Yeah. yeah. And I'll come across something and I'll go, Oh shit. Get rid of that. Yeah. You know? I went through, I went through my Facebook. I went through my Twitter and we I deleted everything that had, I looked up certain words yeah. in each post and I deleted everything I deleted that had my... fucking it. Anything that had anything of any like, yeah, well you're going for like a real job, right? Well, well yeah, of course. Yeah. I just well, don't want people we did, seeing no, we, stuff. We, honestly, we did it for that, but we did it a lot for this yeah. because we kind of came out like two months ago as the owners yeah. when for six months there was no, no one, one knew, knew what we were doing, but yeah. now we knew we were going to put a face to this. And the, what we're saying is, we don't want people to hate the content on our page with 22,000 followers yeah. just because they might not like us. Like the content that we're putting up. We put a lot of time and effort into that. But I don't want people to be like, oh, that's funny. But, you know, the account owner is kind of a dick. So we're not going <laughs> to like as if. I mean, that's why my entire Twitter, I used to post so much stupid shit. Deleted that around two months ago. Even my Instagram. I'll be honest. I used I, I post a lot of like sarcastic shit. That's what I love about yeah. you is like you're you're truthful and like yeah. my sarcastic shit. Like I think one one of my Instagram posts. I mean, sorry guys, but it it, it was like it's pretty simple. But I got some backlash. I was like, imagine how many more likes I'd get if I was a half naked chick. Yeah, and let me That's just fucking, not, yeah. it's so true. I mean, listen. But you what see, cracks me about that? I mean, I know what you guys are trying to accomplish, but at the same token, you are. I mean, it's memes. It's comedy. It, it's jokes, but you people, know. you know, try and take it however they want. And that's why the next thing, Ryan, I want to talk to you about is you know dealing with criticism mm -hmm. we, we see that on on our page i mean the thing is you know we don't deal with it really live in person so much yeah. i mean you probably have to deal with it you know when you're on stage or even after so how do you you know how do you keep going because obviously sometimes the criticism is hard but how do you you know make it do you use it as motivation or well very rarely do people criticize you to your face it's always they go online and they say something and, and look, I'm not saying that I'm, for as much as, uh, I, I don't care about what people think, you know, sometimes you do take things in stride, but again, I, I mean, as far as like content or whatever criticism, I, I can't let it bother me because to me, comedy is an art form. And I hate saying that cause it comes off so pretentious, but it's true. It is. And, and the late great Patrice O'Neill said it best in the attempt of being funny, anything should be able to go. Uh, because again, the, 
the, the intent is not to hurt feelings. The intent isn't like I, I didn't give up a six figure job to go on stage and, and, and find your insecurity and exploit it and make you feel like shit. I just didn't do that. You know? So again, if, if something hurts someone's feelings, I, that's terrible, but it's not what I'm trying to do. You yeah. know, I opened for Andrew Dice Clay a couple of times and I'll never forget the Dice girl who man. I was dating, you know, and, and, you know, it was my most serious relationship since I've been doing this. We were together three years. Dice didn't realize that it was my girlfriend. And he says to her, she's up in the front. He's like, oh, oh honey. No. He goes, the way that you're built. He goes, he goes, you know, but you're not, you're not big enough for me. And, you know, she was thin, but she had big boobs, big butt, hips. And he goes, uh, I want a girl the size of the bed. You know, I want a big fat monster. And then he closes it by going, but you're on the right track. Oh. <laughs> right? And she thought it was great. She was laughing, whatever. After the show, backstage at Caroline's, you know, I bring her back and he was like, oh my God, I'm so fucking sorry. And I'm like, nah, dude, like it's a dice show. She sat up front, whatever. She, her feelings aren't yeah. hurt. Like she's been with me. She knows what, you know, nobody intends. And that's a guy who sold out arenas, who is known for being like the king of in your face. Yeah. You know, I mean, banned from MTV for life in 1990. But even him, he was like, oh shit. Like I didn't want to do that. And, and. You know, so you got it. You walk that line. Nobody wants to hurt feelings. Well, Ryan, quick, uh, just question. I mean, you know, it's more that's because that's like a character he plays. Uh -huh. I mean, right. Like that's not him. And because, you know, oh, yeah. backstage, like yeah. he's a nice guy, right? Like, that's, Very nice guy. People but, just think that's him all the time. Very, I mean, the type of guy that would take pictures with the entire staff. I never forget. I opened for him uh, at that club in Point Pleasant that I was talking about earlier. There was a kid outside um, who, who was obvious, you know, special needs. The ticket, this was one of Dice's first times at the club. I think the ticket was like 90 bucks. So the kid didn't have the money to come in or whatever. The kid stood outside the show the entire time and he had the old school, uh, you know, Dice vinyl. I forget which one it was, but it was the original one. And I walked outside because I, I used to smoke cigarettes at the time. And I see the kid just standing there and he's looking through the window and the show was over. And I go, hey man, what's up? And he goes, oh, he goes, you know, I just want to get this, you know, sign for my dad. My dad and I are big fans. So I went in and I was like, hey, Andrew, you know, there's a kid outside. He's like, oh yeah, bring him in. Kid comes in, he took pictures with him, he signed it. The kid called his dad, Dice got on the phone with him. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he's a sweetheart of a guy. Uh, again, you would never know that from the character. But all comedy, the reason it's called an act is it's an act. You know, it's just like professional wrestling. You turn the volume up to 10. It's, it's a side of yourself. It's based in reality, but you turn the volume up. You know, yeah. that's why I like doing podcasts because like, I feel like I'm being more myself than I am on stage. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. You want to get a few funny lines in, make the people <laughs> laugh because you are a comedian, but it's not the same as, oh shit, I have to be on stage for an hour and get a laugh every nine seconds. Yeah. It's totally different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we were, I mean, not necessarily criticism lately, but we had, as you saw, and you know, if anyone watching saw, we had a guy who was, uh purposely reporting our posts just to get the account taken down basically or he said we actually he said that that was his intention his intention was that he just had a, a bot set up that's you know to report a page over and over and over and over and over again <laughs> and he wanted to see if it would work and he tried it and out he tried us. it out on us for some reason i'm like well, is you there know, like, is there something that you guys ever like alluded to in your content that he took personally or no you don't know? i mean i don't think so no. he, he, that he voiced at least, he said that yeah. he said that we didn't do anything there was he had no and he had no, you know, loser. yeah, but basically that what happened was I was like, we kind of work pretty hard on this. Like, I mean, like we've, you know, got in touch with like, we, we bought all this stuff. We, you know, started up a podcast. We post every day. We make our own things. And he was like, yeah, you don't work very hard. Uh, I posted <sighs> 5,000 memes and only got 35,000 followers. And I'm like, I don't know if you like, you missed that, but that just shows that um, we do a better job than you. We have 130 posts or something, 180 yeah. posts, and we have 22,000 followers. And we did it because we marketed our page. We we got in touch with these uh, local businesses. We put our own, we make our own content, all of it. I mean, 5,000 posts, he was fucking stealing. Well, stuff. what like, I what I, what I I appreciate, the reason why I appreciate what you guys do, and, and, I, and I've learned, uh, I'm getting more involved. I was always active with social media, but I wasn't uh, going about it the right way. Um, what I noticed, there's a comic named Vic DiBattetto who, you know, was like a mentor to me uh, early on in my career and I used to work with and and he went viral. He, It's so funny because I remember doing a show with him and, and he had just gotten an iPhone and he's like, yeah, you know, my son, he gets annoyed, but can you show me how to do this and then that? And I would like, you know, just like, oh yeah, well, that's the record button and all this stuff. And then a couple months, you know, he was putting out videos every day and really grinding it. And then the bread and milk video went super viral 
And he always makes the joke, you know, 30 seconds got me more than 30 years of comedy. Yeah. He went viral. He's blowing up. He's doing theaters now, stuff like that. And he's up in a different stratosphere. Yeah. But my point is, is that he had the tools to back up what the viral fame brought him. Sure. Yeah. And what we're seeing now in stand up, and I'm not shitting on anybody, whatever you, you know, you can do. There are guys that are making funny videos that are now taking it to the stage and they don't have the chops. And they so they're yeah. selling out these places. But then after 15 minutes, it's like, oh, shit. And, yeah. well, you know, look, their fan base loves it. It's funny because the, the Jank shows I'm doing, I got these beautiful, you know, bartenders from Jank's, these girls that, you know, they're they're from Staten Island. They're like, oh, I want so-and-so because he does these videos that makes me laugh. And <laughs> yeah. I go, yeah. And you know what? If I put so and so up there, yeah. and he sucks. unless yeah. he fills the place with his entire fan base, it, it's gonna fucking be bad, yeah. you know. And I'm look, I'm not begrudging him. So what I'm trying to do now is I'm putting a lot more out there as far as you know to that because I know I have the chops now to back it up. Vic DiBattetto had the chops to back it up. A lot of these guys that are really targeting their videos. They get that they get to that level where they can sell out places, but they don't have what it takes to back yeah. it up. And 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 that's you know. Thing. Plus, the other thing I notice too is I'll see people uh, they'll go, "Hey, make this viral, help me." No, yeah. that's not how it works. No, like no. something just has to catch on and and go. And I think the other thing is you talking about people who you know start they make their name like on uh, the video medium, and it, it's easy. I, it's not that it's easier to be funny on video, but you get, I mean, you have takes, you can do it as many times as you want, you can cut it up. And it's like, I think people think that because that they, they're they funny on YouTube or something, yeah. that they can make that transition into stand up or, and, you know, go up live and be just as funny. And then I think when they get up there and they're not as funny, it's kind of like a, you know, like a reality check. Well, it's also too, we, you know, as far as uh, that always existed, yeah. you know, and, and before YouTube and, and, uh, social media as a whole, you had people that could make people laugh at parties and then mm-hmm. thinking, okay, okay, I could be a comic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so funny to me because the, 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 one of the funniest, most purely funny human beings I ever met was this kid, Paul Connor, who I went to elementary and high school with. And it's funny because he's come to see me do stand up a few times and he's like, bro, he's like, I, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, to me, that's funny to hear because I always thought he was the funniest fucking yeah. kid that ever lived. And he still is. Yeah. We had a teacher at, uh, I went to Monsignor Donovan and, and, and God bless him. I hope he's still alive. His name was Deacon Frank and he was a great guy. And he would talk like this <laughs> and he would do the morning announcements and, you know, he'd be like, okay, this Saturday there's a dance. <laughs> and we had him for marriage class, which was hilarious because he would be like, okay, guys, the point of marriage is to live together <laughs> forever in God's kingdom as one. So naturally, we'd fuck with the guy, yeah. right? And I wasn't really good at being able to break his chops because I'd crack up laughing. Paul was just like stone-faced. So one day Deacon Frank starts class and he goes, uh, okay, class, does anyone in here have an exotic pet? I'm not talking about a dog or a cat. Something really out there. So Paul's hand shoots up. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, fuck, don't call on him. Because yeah. I just know this is going to be like brutal, right? <laughs> Paul, what's your exotic pet? Well, Deacon Frank, I have a beaver. And so you would think right <laughs> off the bat, like any normal person, especially an intelligent person, would go... And for those of you listening that aren't Catholic, uh, deacons are basically like priests, except they're allowed to have sex with adults. And uh, (laughs) so he goes, really, Paul, you have a beaver. And Paul goes, "Uh, well, actually, it's my sister's. (laughs) Now that right there, that's you would think, okay, like abort this. Right. So I'm biting my lip. He goes. Tell us about your sister's beaver. Oh, <laughs> set him up like that. So Paul goes, well, you know, it's, it's, uh, she doesn't take good care of it. <laughs> and it's, uh, really hairy and gross and it smells and it's very sloppy. Just right over his head. Well, well, have you ever considered taking care of your sister's beaver? Oh. Paul goes, well, yeah, I tried, but, uh, my father caught me and got really pissed. And so now I'm like, fucking, you know, and to floor. me, that is just like, wow, man, like that, he kept completely straight faced, <laughs> whatever. And yet he's telling me when he sees me on stage, how do you do that? Yeah. I'm like, how do I do that? Bro, we were 15 and yeah. you were talking basically innuendos about your sister's vagina to a deacon. <laughs> like what I, well, like I feel what you did was much yeah. more difficult than what I'm doing. Sure. You know what yeah. I mean? like, so, you know, again, it, it's all about, you know, context and, and how people feel about, you know, whatever. But yeah. 
I'm sorry, I mean, we went way off. No, yeah. I love it's, it's a great story. Like that. That I, I gotta say, man, like out of all of our other like podcasts, like one thing me and Jared were like talking about beforehand was like, you know, we were we were scared with this is people's like first time being in front of the camera sometimes yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And we said to me and like we were like you know, Ryan, it's going to be easy. It's going to be like a conversation and we're all chill guys. So yeah. this is just, it's, it just sounds like us just sitting down or at I just a bar. hope we don't lose any sponsors for, uh, for having me. I don't want Rook to be like, we don't want our pro. Okay. Rook to be doesn't Rook sponsor, doesn't sponsor us, sponsor us anyway. Oh, they don't? I thought nope. they did. No, no. Well, you we're trying. Tape, you should have put tape over there. No, front. no, no. We're trying. We're trying. Oh, we're, trying. we're trying. We can look at all these, look at all these companies oh. right here. Yeah, we're you're trying. Supposed, you're supposed to lie and say they are. I want They're all the, sponsors. Imagine, They're paying us Imagine we get the Costco, Kirkland. That's money. Kirkland. Yeah, I have I have everything, Kirkland. I got toilet paper, everything. I'll never have to pay to wipe my ass again. <laughs> we'll go. To, we'll, go we'll have uh, the food court food. Like I'll put a churro here. That, that you know that two dollar hot dog. Yeah, Sabaro. Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So quickly, I mean, just about like the you know the New Jersey comedy scene. I mean, I know you were saying that you like a lot of like you know you're more into like the smaller comics who really grind and things like that. But there there are some bigger name ones. I know I think John Stewart's from like Middletown. Like he's from yeah. closer to here. Um, well, it's funny. I just did Catch a Rising Star. It's like my home comedy club now. <clears throat> okay. Um, and the room in Princeton, the room, the club in Princeton. Uh, don't want to use too much comedy lingo, but the the club in Princeton. It's been there since like '87, and he started there. Great. Yeah. Um, I've never met John. It's funny you say that, but uh, I have a buddy who is a an architect that actually built his house, and he gave John like my CD and stuff. And John <laughs> was pretty cool, uh, from what I you know was told. I mean, he could have thought I sucked, but told my buddy that he thought it was good. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, Jersey comedy scene. You know, it's tough because like you know, it's New York and L.A. Those are the big scenes per se. And then yeah. Jersey, you have a lot of like these one nighters, and you know, there's a couple you know real comedy clubs. It's the Stress Factory. It's Bananas. It's Catch a Rising Star. Um, and then there's just a lot of these places that you know. You got to be careful sometimes because there'll be people that will lie and say, oh, well, you know, you may have seen him on Comedy Central when in reality he had a free ticket to The Daily Show and the camera panned him. Sure, um, sure. But other than that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in a very good position right now. And uh, I, I it, the Jenks thing really kind of changed uh, the game for me in a lot of ways. Can you talk about that? A Absolutely. Yeah. Um so PJ Storino, whose family uh, owns Jenks and Jenkinsons, we became friendly a couple of years ago. And uh, Joe Romano, who's the bar manager at Jenks, I've known for years from going out and stuff. And they had seen my shows a few times and they had approached me and said, you know, what if we did something like where you were the host, you booked the comics and it's like people that you want to showcase. And I love that idea because I was a huge fan of the old Rodney Dangerfield Young Comedian mm -hmm. Specials yeah. where... Dice and Seinfeld and all those guys got their break. Exactly. And like we were saying before, I would perform at these comedy clubs where if I was the headliner, I'd be like, why they have this guy opening for me? Or if I was the opener, I'd be like, why they have me in front of this headliner, you know? Um, so yeah, it got to a point where I was like, yeah, you know, that's something to think about. But the guy who I was associated with at the time, I was like, I, I know he's going to get pissed. So I kind of put it on the back burner. Then when I separated from that guy, I called them back up. I'm like, do you want to do it? They said, yeah, let's do it. And summer of 2017, we did three shows. We called it Ryan Moore and Friends. Last summer, we did six. Um, and it just it kept growing and growing. This year, they wanted to do every week. And I thought that that might cool. be a little too much. So I said, well, listen, you know, because now school, when I was in high school and elementary school, by June, my birthday is June 17th. My birthday was either after the last day of school or on the last yeah. day. Now school, it's like they're almost going until July. So I said, you know, the teachers aren't going to be off, you know, and the teachers like to come out and party. So we need to start like right, right after 4th of July. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. We're doing nine shows. And I also said to them, I don't want to call it Ryan Marr and Friends anymore. I said, because I feel like that limits it. If you're an Ocean in Monmouth County and you're a comedy fan, you know who I am. But outside of that, you're not going to. So if you see Ryan Marr and Friends Comedy, you could be thinking, like, what is this? Like some shitty improv troupe, whatever. <laughs> so we're called a Jenks Comedy Club hosted by Ryan Marr. And uh, we got nine shows. And I mean, I got some killers, man. I got Shane Gillis, like I said, doing yeah. the first one. Uh, my friend Jesse Mae Peluso, who blew up, we started out together. Um, you know, she wound up blowing up. She was the star of MTV's Girl Code. Yeah. She's been on Joe Rogan's podcast, Joey I'm Diaz's podcast. She's really killing it. She's doing the September 1st show. So I bookended that with like, those are like the two names yeah. on the up and up. And then everybody else are just these solid headliners. I also have Nori Davis, August 18th. He just had a Comedy Central special in November. And these are all people that, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with over the years. 
And there's shows that I wanted to book, guys I want to showcase, women I've wanted to showcase. And the way that I paired the shows, I, I said, okay, this guy's act is going to work well with this one. It's going to be a solid show from start to finish. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, between Bar A with Tommy Janarone and 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 the guys at Jenks, like they're letting me do what I want to do. And it's so cool that they're saying, hey, you know what? We're going to pay you and we're going to give you the space, but we trust you. You know, like tomorrow at Bar A, I got Gabby Bryan, hilarious. Uh, Dennis Rooney, just a killer. Uh, actually tough to follow, which I like. I like that. Um and it's, it's, just, it's just a great time, man. I, yeah. I like being able to do that. I, I don't like, I've never been the type that can be like, oh, well, you know, I don't want my opener to not be, you know, too strong. Yeah. And you deal with that too. I've had big names who I won't mention that I've opened for them once. And the next time they'd be like, oh no, we can't have him. <laughs> because, you know, no motherfucker, they're there to see you. Yeah. yeah. You know, like they're not paying to see Ryan Moore. You should want them to already be at this point. Yes. Yeah. You know, so that you could just keep them there or bring it higher. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess at that point we can move on to uh, what we're going to do is our last segment, which for the past couple of podcasts has been like a 20 questions rapid fire. But because, you know, we've heard so much about your uh, days as a train conductor and how much you hated it, uh-huh. we thought that we'd come up with a, a game where we say train conductor or this job. I just want to, cl- and, and I will play this game, but yes. I just want to clarify that there were elements of the job that I hated that I, I was more in my own head. Sure. I didn't like the downtime where you'd have like the two hour break and you were stuck talking to some of these miserable motherfuckers. Because honestly, if you've ever ridden a train, you have seen yes. how unhappy these guys are. Mm-hmm. And look, a lot of it is because dealing with the public is not easy, but a lot of these guys choose to be fucking miserable. Yeah. You know, it's funny too, the laziness too. I was When I was just in LA, I took a train from, well, I was in California. I took a train from Ventura to LA and it was a two hour train ride through Amtrak and I was looking forward to it because I'm like, you know, it's going to be scenic. It's going to be beautiful. I've never seen this side of California from the train. My buddy, I swear to God, he says to me, he goes, don't buy a ticket. I go, why? He goes, because you were a train conductor. You know how it works. He goes, they're not going to want to cut the ticket on the train. It's like a $50 train ticket. I get on, I sit down, the conductor comes over. He goes, ticket. I go, hey man, I'm from New Jersey. I didn't know how to work the machine. He goes, okay, I'll be right back. He never came never back. Never came for the back. Two yep. and, then, nah. and, and we see train conductors, like they're just yeah. lazy. Not yeah. all of them, but just miserable. We see that. We do that too yeah. when we go to Bar A all the time. We yeah. take we the, train the train to Belmore. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and they, like, we, I have the app on my phone. Like, yeah, so okay. what I'll do is I'll be like, ah, oh, man, like I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm down. Like I'm, I can't connect to the internet. I'll open it right now. And the guy's like, all right, I'll be back in five minutes. Never, never comes Well, back. it's funny never. because I used to, I used to do those Bar A trains occasionally in the summer. And it was funny because, all the other conductors hated them because they were the bar A trains yeah. and like they didn't want to deal with you guys. Yeah. And I hated them because I wanted <laughs> to be partying with you guys. Like, yeah. like, Fuck this, dude. Because bar A back in the day, I mean, even in the winter, my first time ever at bar A was a Tuesday in the winter and the line would be down the block. So, yeah. You know, because it was just kick ass. And that was before Asbury became huge and Pier Village. Yeah. So if you went to Mammoth, you were going to bar A. They had shuttles going back and forth. Yeah, it was like wild. Tuesday. Yeah beat the clock so i'll i'll start out so i'll, I'll do the hopefully, first one hopefully you don't pick train conductor for everything that would kind of take the fun away from <laughs> yeah. that, we'll say. um so the first one that we're going to do train conductor or so ready train conductor or sewer cleaner i'd have to go train conductor because i have a really weak stomach like if, <laughs> like, like well, if, you're not gonna you're gonna pick train conductor for everything then. like like i like i saw your dog uh and i was like i don't even want to pick up that dog shit <laughs> Oh, so, you don't. You really don't. Yeah, I can imagine. So I, uh, yeah, no, I'd pick train conductor. All right, here's the, this this one's train conductor or animal urine correct collector. Oh, yeah, I mean, train conductor, definitely. <laughs> so train conductor or manure I see where your guys' minds inspector. are at when you were thinking of uh, Trust me, it, get, this game. What was it, it gets one? much worse. Train conductor or manure inspector. I, I think, yeah, I think we know. Now I know why you prefaced it with, I hope you don't pick train. Did you guys really think I'd be like, yeah, animal feces is better <laughs> yeah. than. Uh, well, I, didn't I don't know. know. If, if it was such a miserable experience, maybe you have like PTSD yeah. when you even think about it. Well, maybe uh, you would stop really it with it. I could tell you're young too. PTSD is for soldiers. Well, and that's no, it. They, okay, they, stop they, it. They call, listen, hindsight is always 2020 so you might be looking back like oh you know it wasn't that bad but if you were a train conductor right now you'd be like oh i'll fucking take that animal urine right now you know that that's a good point too it's funny i there was a one guy who was a corrections officer who was like you know he goes this is fucking worse than being a corrections officer and i'm like really dude i'm like you know you get to it's completely different animal yeah like you know whatever i mean perspective is everything keep going sure (laughs) go next year (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this next one yeah train train conductor or barnyard masturbator 
That's a job. It's a, you know they artificially where inseminate do, cows. Where do I send my resume for that? <laughs> one? Um, I'll jerk off a cow. Is it the same as milking a cow? I mean, yeah, yeah but it's it, just but one. It's yeah, not, it's not yeah, udders. But, it's a but, dick. Yeah, but what about like for the you know like those million dollar horses? Like obviously, yeah, well, like you probably get a lot of money to jerk off those horses. Yeah. I saw a thing on Real Sports a bunch of years ago where there was like this one horse that it, they would charge. Yeah, for him to stud like it yes. was like seventy thousand. It goes and, for oh, more. It's unbelievable. And, and this fucking horse that. would bang twenty mares a day I, or something like that. I was I in I was in Kentucky working on a shoot. Like, Were you? Yeah, I was in Lexington. I was working. marrying my cousin. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I was in Kentucky <laughs> marrying. My, no, I was working on a I was working on a, uh, a documentary down there, and I was talking to this uh, to this guy. He was uh, like, they're all crazy about horses. They're all crazy about the Derby, and there's so many expensive barns. Like American Pharaoh is like two hundred thousand well, dollars. It's owned by um, what I think Taylor. Um, I forget the company, but yeah, like or the, the business, but yeah, it's, it's sold I mean, for like $200,000 just, you yeah. know, for him to mate with one of the yeah. other horses. It, 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 it just dawned on me that you remind me of uh, Johnny Lawrence from Cobra Kai, the young Johnny oh Lawrence. Oh my God. Kid. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what is this guy? Like he reminds me of young, you guys watch that? I'm yeah, like, uh, yeah it's, on, it's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge like karate kid nerd. Like yeah. it came out in 84. I was only one, but like my dad can got I, me Can you it. give me Ralph Macchio or no? Not even no, close. No, no, get the fuck out of here. I would love to. You kind of look like, what was the guy on My Name is Earl? Like he's kind of. Oh God. Oh, what's his name? Yeah, Jason, was it Jason Lee? Was Jason Lee. Yeah, yeah, I think it yeah, was Jason Lee. All right, more, more of this, okay, let's, more let's of this uh, titillating game. So yeah. train conductor or a roller coaster vomit collector? So the people that just... You You're get, just making up jobs. No, no I swear real, to God. I thought it was up. made up, but I looked it up. It no, is a real that would job. be like the guy... So that would be basically a maintenance person at the theme park. No, but there was it. at this specific theme park, there was a ride that people <laughs> threw up on so often that his only job... Really? ...was to clean up vomit on this specific ride. I gotta go train conductor. Yeah. Because it's all bodily fluid shit. Yeah, I can't I can't true. handle it. My stomach's weak. Train conductor hazmat diver. So what a hazmat diver does is they put on a suit, like yeah, a hazmat suit, yeah. and they jump into da- dangerous chemicals. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> but why would they why would they what's the like are they looking for, for repa- something? For repairs and stuff like that. If there's like if they're like in a, you know, it's like a waste facility or something yeah, like that, no. they gotta jump in there. Fuck that, dude. This one, this one this next one's not as bad. Yeah. This uh, you'd actually well, be I'll, make, I'll you'd be making more than like six figures doing this next yeah. one. So So train conductor or male proctologist? What? So I'd have to just like yeah. you know, look up assholes all Pretty day. Pretty much all Only day. dudes, so like no no chicks though. Oh yeah, because sometimes I want to even inspect a woman's <laughs> asshole. What kind of shit are you into? I don't know if it's like if I mean, it look, makes it even worse. Look, I'll eat ass, but I've never wanted to. I've never wanted to go up there with a flashlight and be like, "Oh, do you have hemorrhoids?" I mean, what the? You Four. guys are into some wacky shit. He's like, only males, only <laughs> male that, rectums. That was him. No. That was uh, entirely it, you. It pays like four hundred a it's year. Four hundred thousand right? dollars a year. Yeah, though. but that's a lot of schooling involved, and that's, that's got to be depressing. And I also read something too, where like dentists have like the highest suicide rate of any occupation because it's like a very depressing thing, like looking in people's mouths. So, I mean, I'm like, how are proctologists not hire? Like you're yeah. in people's yeah. assholes. No, yeah. I'm going to go with train conductor. I'm okay. sorry, guys. I feel it's like okay. I'm disappointing you here. No, but no, no. It's sorry, good. We're still having good conversations. <laughs> so that's, that's all that matters. Uh, tr- it, it's, the next. Yeah, train conductor or slaughterhouse worker. Yeah, train conductor. You know, here's the thing. I'm not going to be one of those. I, I, I fucking, I love meat. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't think I could ever, and I, I hate saying it because I know it's a necessity, but I don't think I could bring myself to, to kill an animal. I have a buddy who's a cop in Brick and, yeah. and he tells me about like when a deer, and I love venison too. I love yeah. venison. Um, but, you know, he'll even tell me stories about like a deer getting hit by a car and then like they have to shoot it to like put it out of its misery. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even think you I can do bad. that. Yeah. yeah. No. So yeah, I, I no, that definitely train conductor. Okay. So train conductor, this is kind of weird. What is this like? Chimney sweeper. So, what would you rather do? What am I fucking uh, chim chim chiru? <laughs> yeah, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. yeah, yeah. Uh, Dick Van Dyke over here. Yeah. Um, Spitting image. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll go train conductor. This okay. might, we might as well skip this next one, but train conductor or porta potty cleaner? Oh, dude. That, 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 well, that, that, what do they do? They put like well, a you, hose to a truck, right? Yeah, yeah, but you have to drive around that truck that smells like, you know, shit. So you're smelling. You like don't actually go in I there. I could listen. I could listen to podcasts all day. Yeah, um, like this one. Yeah. No. You, you know what? I mean, it depends. I, I would have to know more about the job. That actually doesn't sound too bad because you're not actually like you just put the hose down. And yeah. Just it up, right? Yeah. True. You don't I still got to go, go train conduct. Maybe it wasn't that fucking bad. I wonder if they'll take me back. <laughs> yeah. This is yeah. This will push you back into yeah. doing that part time. So the next one, um, I'm gonna say, but I want to have Jr. explain because he he picked this. Okay. Um, so, so train. Why conductor, are you putting this on me? Train conductor <laughs> or a fluffer? 
Do you know what a fluffer yeah, is? Yeah, I know what a fluffer okay. is. But if it, I mean, if if it was females, obviously I would choose fluffer. Yeah. Okay. What, so. what, what if what if what if the only opening was <laughs> no. a male fluffer? No, and you don't. What if they were giving you a hundred thousand dollars? Not doing it because you know what? They don't pay men as much in that industry. That's and I true. Think someone don't. needs to make a stand. Yeah. True. Johnny Sins represent. Yeah. Um, wow, he knows names. <laughs> he's the guy. O- only only the male names. Yeah. Yeah. Only 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 <sighs> names. Sure. I know a lot of. It's funny. I uh I got to do the Fanny Awards a couple of years ago. I wrote jokes. Oh no. And uh, <laughs> and it was basically the Fanny Awards are like the Porn Choice Awards. So yeah. Um, it was through Exotica and it was in Atlantic city and dude, it was just, it was wild. I mean, some of the shit that I saw, it got to a point, Ron Jeremy came up. So basically I was associated. It wasn't a manager, but there was a guy who I knew who, uh, he got attached to, you remember Bell Knox? She was the Duke university porn star. Yeah, I, yes. She made like national Max news. Like, she was I on, watched her all the she time. Was on she was on Piers Morgan. So she was appearing. So they were like, oh, we'll walk on the red carpet with her or whatever, do your thing. And because I was at her booth for Exotica, Ron Jeremy comes over to introduce himself to her. And then I get introduced to Ron Jeremy and he's like, oh, you're a comic. And I'm like, yeah. And he's telling me stories about like doing cocaine with Rodney Dangerfield and like <laughs> all this stuff. And I'm like, this is, this guy's so fucking cool. By the end of the night, I was like, get Ron Jeremy the fuck away from me. Yeah. He was so fucking <laughs> annoying. And like, it was just, and, and it was, a, dude, it was an interesting business, man. They gave the one guy, Evan Stone, like a, a lifetime achievement award and he fucking cried. Oh my and I'm God. sitting yeah. there going, oh no, nah, that's bullshit. It's gotta be an act. But no, dude, like he was legit. Yeah, they get into like, it. Dude, it, it, no, it's a I don't judge him. You yeah. know, I'm not going to be one of those guys that pretends like I don't occasionally watch. You know, uh, yeah, wait, what's porn? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever. So, it's one of those things where it's like, God bless them. But yeah, yeah I, w- I would, if I could be a female fluffer, I would, of course, take that over yeah. train conducting okay. any day. So, the next one, Ryan, would you rather be a train conductor or the cleaner of roadkill? Well, going back to what I just said about uh, my buddy who's the cop who had to shoot a deer, I- I'd have to go train conductor. I-, I can't handle dead animals. So I would just look at me them. Up. Yeah, man. I mean, like I saw a squirrel a couple of weeks ago get nailed by the car in front of me, and that fucked me up. So I actually one night, squirrels. one night, I'm, and I felt really bad about this too. I used to drive a Ford Mustang convertible. It was yeah. 2006. Bought Ooh. it right off the showroom floor. It was beautiful. This is when I was train conductor and made money. And uh, me and Tommy Janarone, the one night from Varre, were driving and we stopped at the White Castle on 35 in Eatontown, actually. And just and made a meme about. And yeah. we're and we're driving you know, back to his house in Interlake and then I'm going down 35 and I got like a bag of White Castle and I got like a burger uh, in each hand and I'm steering with like my knee, right? Which is fucking dangerous. <laughs> I do it all the time. And a possum comes walking across Ooh. and I felt so terrible because there was no way I could swerve, you know, and then I wasn't going to slam on the brakes. So Tommy's in the front seat, I'm driving and I see it and it looks up at me and I angled it so that my car the tires wouldn't hit it, that it would just go right over. But the Mustang was so low to the ground that all you heard was the thing looks up and then you just heard, and I went, oh, fuck. And I'm like, don't look back, don't look back. And I looked back and the thing was just fucking, and I was yeah. like, oh, man. And that ruined my like life for two weeks. I was like, oh, that fucking thing. You're thinking about so it. I couldn't pick it up. I couldn't clean. No way. And this but is, we're ending on a very positive note. This next way. one's even better. <laughs> we just want to ruin your yeah. day. We really want to ruin your day. We want you to go home feeling miserable. Be like, what the fuck did I come on? <laughs> Last one is train conductor and embalmer. Would that be like funeral director or is embalmer? No, you would be the person who actually takes the body and prepares them for well, the that's funeral. That's a funeral director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I'd have, to, yeah well, I'd have to go with train conductor. I. Uh, it's funny, though, that you mentioned that because a girl... Who I went to high school with, who was a smoke show and still is like we're on Facebook. I haven't seen her in years, but judging by her picture, she still is. She actually hit me up and was like, uh, oh, my God, I'm going to come to one of your shows this was like within the last two months. And then she's like, oh, no, I can't. I got called into work. And so I'm thinking, like, oh, what do you do? And, I'm, oh. and she's like, I'm a funeral director. And it's just, you know, it's one of those things you don't think like, you know, I've obviously I graduated high school almost 20 years ago, 2001. You don't know what paths people take, but it's like, I wouldn't, you, I don't know. I guess you just have this macabre kind of, uh, you know, visual or stereotype of the people that would get into that line yeah. of work. But yeah. apparently it's very lucrative. And, uh, but you know what? I'm still going to punch tickets and open doors. I mean, on yeah, the train. you should definitely contact the NJ Transit because it sounds like you really fucking miss it. Unless I'm fluffing females. Unless you're fluffing females, yeah. you yeah. will absolutely so choose So either one. Conductor. So just put that I mean, on. I got to see what the medical benefits would be to be a fluffer. Uh, I would assume they're not very good. No. 
But you're always, probably have a very high, I mean, high chance of STDs. So, it's but you certainly like, well, wearing gloves. Don't get because I have anxiety gloves. lately now too. Like what I like a hypochondria thing. Being yeah. involved in the pro wrestling business and, and comedy and all this stuff, mm-hmm. I, I I see a lot of people die. You know, yeah. you just do. So like anytime anything happens, I'm like, oh my God, what do I have? Like I'll WebMD myself. Oh, me, I am exactly the same way. So my mom is a nurse and, you know, her and I have always been very close. And she actually said to me, she's like, you're driving me fucking nuts. She's like, you have health insurance. You're paying for it. Go to a doctor. <laughs> so I went and I picked uh, Dr. Jerry Horowitz as my primary doctor because I like a kind of doctor that I don't have to be judged by. Like uh, Dr. Horowitz, he's like a, a big, you know, oafish kind of a guy. Mm. Um, his lab coat always has coffee stains on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, okay. And I still find myself lying to him like yeah. because he'll say to me like, uh, you know, well, uh, how often do you drink? I'm like, yeah, occasionally. He's like, well, how often's occasionally? I'm like, eh, maybe eight times a week. Yeah. He's like, that's more than occasionally, you know? <laughs> and then he'll be like, uh, marijuana use? And I'll be like, oh, definitely occasionally. He's like, okay, <laughs> how often? I'm like, well, when I wake up in the morning and when I go to bed at night. So I still lie to him. But he goes, listen, he goes, I'm going to test you for everything. He goes, I'm going to do the blood work. He goes, I'm going to test for AIDS. And I'm like, I'm too fat for AIDS. Right? <laughs> I've seen Philadelphia with Tom Hanks. I definitely don't have AIDS. <laughs> and so we're going through the whole thing. And he goes, I'm only going to call you. He goes, if, you know, there's something seriously yeah. wrong. He goes, if you don't hear from me, no news is good news. So I'm like, all right, fine. So I take the blood work. They send it to the lab. Three days later, phone rings, Dr. Horowitz's office. I see it on the phone. I'm like, oh my God, I'm dying, right? <laughs> Answer the phone. Woman goes, uh, hi, this is Bianca from Dr. Horowitz's office. Is this Ryan Marr? I go, yes, it is. She goes, hi, Ryan. How are you? I'm like, I'm good, Bianca. What's up? She's like, this is Ryan, correct? I'm like, yes, this is Ryan. What's up? She goes, I have your test results. I'm like, okay, you know, fucking get to it. Thinking like, you know, oh my God, I have diabetes, yeah. right? That's that's a possibility, right? Yeah. So all this stuff. So she goes, okay, let me see. I'm like fucking ready to put my <laughs> head through the, the wall. Point. Yeah. She goes, okay, you have a vitamin D deficiency. Oh yeah. So I go, really? That's why you fucking called? <laughs> She's she like, goes, yeah. she goes, yeah, you have a vitamin D deficiency. You have a prescription that I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll just drink more in the sun. I yeah. go, summer's coming. I'll be at Bar A. I'll be at Tiki Monday. I'll be at Jenks. Like, this guy told me we're only going to call him something serious. I'm like, and now I need to drink more milk? Yeah. If I can really, like. She's like, yeah, you got a vitamin D deficiency and like herpes. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And just even herpes, like that me. ain't going to kill you, you know? No. And you can only catch it on an outbreak, I think, right? Sure. Yes. Yeah, I think. Yeah, when yeah. that's true. When yeah, who needs yeah. condoms? I'm not a sailor. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, this this basically wraps up the uh, the podcast. I okay. want to say, Ryan, thanks again for coming Thank on. Thank you, guys. I had a lot of fun, and uh, I'm Ryan Mar Comedy on Instagram. Yeah, I want you to plug, to tell us about, like, you know, all, like, the future stuff of, like, the, yeah. the dates of, like, I'll the I'll just stick stuff. with, the, you know, right now, Ryan Mar Comedy on Instagram, Good. R-Y-A-N-M-A-H-E-R Comedy. Uh, like, you know, you guys pointed out, some of the better jokes on Facebook, I'll just screenshot and post on the story on Instagram. Um, Facebook's fun. That's the one thing that I do prefer about Facebook over Instagram. And maybe this is showing my age. What I like the interactions with people. And, and sometimes, you know, you get really good threads going on Facebook that I feel you don't get on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes I'll even screenshot some of that craziness too. And I'll post it to my story. So if you guys want to follow me, please do so. Uh, by the time this podcast airs, the gigs that I have this weekend, obviously will be passed, but I'll be at Jenks. Um, Jenks Comedy Club hosted by Ryan Moore every Tuesday night this summer. Uh, tickets are ten dollars if you're a Jenks VIP Club uh, card holder. VIP card holder, uh, you get the the show for free. So July seventh, we got Shane Gillis. Uh, July fourteenth, R.C. Smith. Twenty first, uh, Tim Crompier. Twenty eighth, Mark Riccadonna. August fourth, Chrissy Mayer. August eleventh, we're doing a hypnotist show, which is really cool. And my buddy Mike Racine's also headlining that. Never one. He's done had a Comedy that. Wow, Central okay. special. Uh, August 18th, we got Nori Davis. August 25th, we got Joey Gay, who was a finalist on the original season of Last Comic Standing. Hilarious. And then September 1st, Jesse May Peluso. So those are the shows this summer at Janks. They're all on Tuesday nights. Uh, 8.30 at night, you'll be home. You know, the show will be out between 10 and 10.30, so you'll be home by 11 if you're local. <laughs> and uh, yeah, man, just Ryan Moore Comedy Instagram, and we'll we'll definitely bullshit and have oh, yeah. fun. I can't wait. We're, we're, yeah, it. we're going Definitely. to Bar A. By the time this, like you're saying, airs, we're, we're going to go to your Bar A show. We can't wait for that. Definitely um, in the summer, though. I'd yeah, love to go. For sure. It'd be awesome. We're I really did a hypnotist good. show once, and I, it didn't work. I couldn't. I, I, didn't, where'd you, I didn't. Where'd you go to? I was in Vermont for oh, like God. a summer, and there was this guy, and like half the people, it worked. Half the people didn't. This work. guy that I have August 11th, his name is Denny Moore. And it's funny because uh, Brittany Storino from Jenks 
was actually the one who wanted a hypnotist. She's like, I, I, I want a hypnotist here. So I went and I got Denny Moore and, um, I had never worked with Denny, but ironically he was the guy for years at Fright Fest, yeah. Six Flags Great Adventure. He had a show called Hypnisteria. And when I was like 17, I went up and I got hypnotized by him. And he's also been on the Jerry Springer show. So he's done some wild shit and he's a comic too. So it's going to be more of like an adult oriented hypnotist show. Uh, and then I got Mike Racine, who's a hilarious comic. He's going to do like a half hour beforehand. So it's going to be fun, man. I'm really just trying to, you know, bring back that whole night out. I like the idea of doing a show where people can come out. We've had people last summer that would come out to me and go, Hey, you know, uh, I was with my wife and my grandkids. We got a house for the week. I just wanted to get out and have a few beers. I'm walking Good. on the boardwalk. I saw yeah. the sign. We came in. Sure. That's what I love doing. I, yeah. I like that aspect of like, kind of like what Wildwood does. And, uh, you know, what we see in, uh, God Secrets in Ocean City, Maryland. Oh, good, Not even yeah. Seaside. The Jersey Shore has kind of gotten away from entertainment like as, as a night out option. It's all just bars, bars, the DJs, clubs. clubs. It is. You know, so what I like is is almost having like that dinner and show type of feel. And yeah. I feel like there's nobody else doing that. So if you want to come out and have fun on a Tuesday night, Jank's Club this summer. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to go. Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, podcast comes out every other Friday. So, uh it's- Leave comments, likes, let us know who you'd like to see on, what kind of questions you'd like us to ask, and uh, look forward to seeing you then. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching. Thank you, guys.